This time on Lifelinks, our reporters meet survivors of a horrific act. FGM, or female genital mutilation. And FGM is this time's hashtag. Yalda travels to Senegal to meet a young woman working to save girls from a life of pain. In Britain, Jan learns that FGM is not just an African problem. And in Germany, Anna explores how reconstructive surgery can heal not only the physical damage, damage done to two million girls each year. Use our hashtag to join the conversation. welcomed by posters that plead for an end to female genital mutilation and sexual violence. I'm in Senegal, where one in four women have had FGM. Here in the southeastern village of Dugui, nearly every woman is affected. This lovely, upbeat atmosphere is not quite what I expected on a reporting trip about this topic. But today's dancing is part of an official event to celebrate changing attitudes towards FGM. The goal is to abandon this long-held tradition. To achieve this, 25-year-old Gundo is working with the village elders. <laughs> The custom in the Soninke ethnic group is that most women were cut when they were infants. That's not unusual for Senegal, where 75% of girls who undergo FGM are younger than four. Until recently, it was unthinkable for a mother to take a stand against this tradition. Some of this change is due to strong women like Gundo. She works for an international aid organization called Tostan that's providing facts about FGM. Gundo's mother lacked information and followed tradition. This is the first time that mother and daughter have talked about the ritual. Before today, it was taboo. Traditions dictate the different ways women are cut. 80% of women are cut in one of two ways. Either the clitoris is cut off, or the clitoris and inner labia are cut away. In the most extreme type, the outer genitals are largely cut away and the woman is sewn closed, with only a small hole left for urination and menstruation. In all, 140 million women across the globe are affected by FGM. Thirty thousand girls and women living in Germany have had genital mutilation. In
In a high-rise development on the outskirts of Dortmund, I meet with 22-year-old Bintu. She shares a small apartment with her son. A girlfriend has come along with her daughter for support. Bintu tells me her story of being cut at the age of 12 when she was growing up in Gambia. Yeah, they told us that in one week time, you girls will be going for FDM. But you're going to kill your crocodile. I'd imagine a teenage girl going to kill, you see a crocodile, face the crocodile and kill. That was so amazing. And imagine if they tell you that you're going to a place where the money will be flowing from the tree. You, you can have any amount of money you need. You will be eating apples, bananas, and lots of amazing things. So it was only joy that came to our hands, and we couldn't even wait for the day to come. The women of the family brought Bintu and 30 other girls to a distant village that was only open to women. There was a big celebration, and her grandmother danced for them. But during the dance, Bintu noticed her grandmother was crying. Yes, she was singing in my local language, like if I can translate the song in English, it's like the birds that are flying inside the air, you can tell this. My daughter does today her... <laughs> Shall I go with him? Yeah. Come, come, Kleiner. Yeah, please give us. We were 30 girls that went, but we came out less, less than 30. Three girls were dead. According to our tradition, they told us that those girls were eaten by the crocodile. They were blindfolded and their hands were tied. Then they led them one by one to an exciser, a woman whose job it is to perform FGM. They caught my clitoris. Then after cutting that, they, you know, tomato, tomato and pasta. Mm -hmm. They use the tomato and pasta to cover it. This tomato paste have to mix with the blood. So that is how they call the sealing of the virginity. Bintu bled for days afterward. When she spoke out against the tradition, her community disowned her and left her on the fringe. It's okay, I can continue. Her father hoped to bring her back into the community by forcing her to marry. On the wedding night, the exciser arrived for a second time. They are opening for you to sleep with your man. This razor blade like this, they will cut it into two. Only this edge, they yeah. will use to force it inside you. Ugh. They have to force this thing inside mm -hmm. the vagina. When the blood come out, the man have to jump on top of you. The man have to sleep with you by force, because if not, it will, if it is. Uh, it will yeah. go together oh. again. Bintu defended herself, ran away on her wedding night, and in response, her father threatened to kill her. Her school helped her escape. She made the journey to Germany and was granted asylum. Now she's making a new life here and working as an apprentice to a cook. My body is lacking something very important. Yeah, something really important. The most important part of my body has been removed. And that is something that can never be brought alive there. It's like killing somebody, and the person can never be brought alive, yeah. The person, a dead person is always a dead person. Bintu says she's often thought of suicide, but she's the sole caregiver for her son, and she wants him to have a better life than her own. She's telling her story because she feels this is her only weapon in the fight against FGM. More girls and women are affected by FGM in the UK than in any other country in Europe. An estimated 140,000 women and girls who live here had to go through it. Many of them are migrants from Africa. I meet Nimco. She came to the UK from Somalia as a little girl. 
but during a summer trip to their home country, the family decided to have her cut. She was seven years old. This is Zoe. Hi. Yeah, I'm by myself. 25 years later, she's now an outspoken activist who's changed the tone of the debate on FGM in Britain. It was very much something that identified you, and I used to think, well, I've had FGM, I'm over it, and now I'm getting on with my life. And I really wanted that conversation to carry on, but then, then I realised that if I did not come forward and say, hey, I'm one of the people that's had it, but I'm, always, I'm also on the other side, then people were thinking, well, if you can have FGM, then it can be anywhere. And I'm like, exactly. It's nothing to do with um, not being educated or all these things. It's to do with the, um, the lack of agency within girls and within, like, you know, girls being protected. But I know a lot of women in this room have been, like, you know, been through so many things, and I want to give them the confidence, them and also everybody else, that it's not you that's at fault, it's the, it's the society and that issue that's at fault, and we can't, and you can get over it. I don't know. It's just, like, just normal things. really key to the issue. Female genital mutilation was made illegal in the UK in the 1980s. But in some parts of London, the proportion of women cut is estimated at up to 5%. The highest rate is in the borough of Southwark in South London. During summer vacation, young girls are often sent back to the home country of their parents and cut there. Apparently 5% of women, that's the estimate around here, like, have oh, been affected it. by it, yeah. Bruh, no, I would never do that, ever, ever, ever. That's, so how do they even get, like, pleasure afterwards, like, cutting it off? I wouldn't accept it in this country because um, it's not part of the culture here in the UK, so I wouldn't really accept it. But if people are against it because they're doing it in Africa, I think they should, um, this is the culture. So we can't leave our country and then go to other people's country and tell them what to do. They've been doing it for years, so. It's sheer ignorance. It's not, it's nothing to do with religion. It's not, it's nothing, I don't think it's anything to, well, if it is something to do with culture, it's, it's, um, uh, 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 crass culture that, I mean, well, I can't find the right dis adjective, but it's, it's culture that needs to go. It's unlikely that this 2,000-year-old tradition will go away easily. It's too deeply embedded in society. I visit an old woman who's been an exciser for decades. She earned her living by performing FGM and has cut countless girls, including her own granddaughters. She no longer works as an exciser and says she stopped because she sees how much it hurts women. She describes to me what she did to the girls until just recently. Est-ce qu'il y avait des moments où vous pensez de ne plus vouloir le faire aussi Alors, je suis venu à la maison, 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 je suis venu à
This is where doctors repair damage done by excisors. Today, there are surgical options to reconstruct parts of the clitoris and to reform the labia. Since 2013, roughly 70 patients were treated in Berlin's Waldfriede Hospital. It's one of only a few hospitals worldwide that perform these types of surgeries. Und schon, ja, wir waren zufrieden. Also im Prinzip, es handelte sich um eine Typ 2 ähm, Beschneidung. Das heißt, die Klitoris und ein Teil der kleinen Schamlippen sind entfernt worden. Äh, die Patientin hatte eigentlich die Öffnung, war groß genug und da hatte sie auch keine körperlichen Probleme. Aber das ganz große Problem bei diesen Patienten ist natürlich diese psychische Schädigung. Dass, dass, dass sie das Gefühl haben, das ganze Leben ihnen ist etwas geraubt worden und, und das wollen sie so gut wie möglich wiederhergestellt werden, um sich ganz zu fühlen. Wie lässt sich eine Klitoris wieder äh, rekonstruieren? Woher wird die Haut genommen bzw. wie funktioniert da das Prinzip? Ja, also die Klitoris selber kann man natürlich nicht rekonstruieren, die ist also zum Teil weg, aber es wird immer nur der obere Teil der Klitoris entfernt, sodass man halt die, die Verlängerung, also den tiefen Teil, äh, lockern kann aus seinem Bett und so weit nach oben bringen kann, dass er wieder sichtbar wird. Wie effektiv ist denn die Methode? Ist ähm, FGM nach einer äh, Operation, hat sich das erledigt und der Frau geht es wieder gut? Oder? Nicht jede Frau, die in die Sprechstunde kommt, wünscht eine Operation. Aber auch gerade die Nachbehandlung ist extrem wichtig. Gerade so eine Frau, die wir jetzt gerade operiert haben, die einfach kein Selbstwertgefühl hat, ähm, das kann man nicht wieder erlangen, indem man jetzt einfach nur in Anführungsstrichen die Titoris rekonstruiert. Da gehört ganz viel psychologische Unterstützung ähm, dazu. I learn about the devastating psychological effects of FGM from this young woman. Nine years ago, she left her home in Gambia and freed herself from a forced marriage. Fearing the hatred and hostility of her family and the African community, she wants to remain anonymous. This is the first time she tells her story publicly. He said that we're going to have a party. We're going to buy a nice dress for you. I used to love banana. They told me they're going to buy a banana for me, so I just follow her. We get into a car, then we go. They left me with that lady and her friends, so they undressed me. I was naked. They put me down on a floor. I lie there. Like, like this, face up. I was lying on my back, so they hold my hand. Somebody have to sit here. Someone pinned you yeah, down? Yeah, pinned me down, and somebody was holding my leg. One is holding this one, one is holding that one. They just caught. I can't remember what type of knife do they use, but they use knife. What were you was, feeling at, oh, at that? The pain. And I didn't see anyone that I know, and I was young because I was seven, nearly eight. Mm -hmm. So I need someone at least that I know, but no, I just, I'm just seeing strangers. And they just left you there yeah, on they the just floor left me still? Yeah, they just left me there and they take the other one. I was the first to do, and they take the other one. So that one was bleeding, 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 but they didn't care. One died when she was getting her first baby, and the first, and the only one left in the, left in that group and the only one left in that <laughs> so we'll, we'll stop for a bit yeah. Yeah. when i'm having sex mm. like you know people like they cry because they like because of pleasure for me mm. i cry because it's painful for the past two years i didn't have sex because it's so painful i can't so any man that I met, he will just sleep with me for a once. That's it. He will not want to see me again. And blood coming out of me. Still now, I know that one. I will live with it for the rest of my life. I never tell it to anyone, unless doctors.
The young woman has applied for asylum in Britain. She doesn't want to go back to Gambia under any circumstances. She's afraid her father will kill her. Men play a decisive role when it comes to upholding the abuse that is FGM. Solomon is one of the few male activists who fight against FGM. He's regularly trying to convince men to spare their daughters. How many people have good TV say, take my country? Why do you think it's important for men to get involved in the fight to stop this? Yeah, because I have always argued that FGM is done on women, but it's done for, for men. That is the underlying cause, the underlying reason, to control the sexuality of you know, the, the woman and so that she stays loyal and obedient to the man. Traditionally, FGM has been left to be seen as a woman issue. Yeah. Men never get, got involved, you know. So the men have willingly withdrawn themselves and the women have happily continued that, that tradition. They don't get the men involved. Yeah. Okay? It is seen as a woman issue, not as a woman's man's issue. Business. A woman's business. But when the man decides to, stop, to step in, you know, breaking some kind of tradition yeah. and says, no, it needs to stop here, then I don't think they can fight back and stop that. That's not, that's not possible usually. Things seem to change. Yeah. I, you know, you hear more stories, you know, more commitment. It's true. If you want to change something, you need to talk to the men. In Senegal, men are the village heads and make the important decisions. I ride with Gundo to a neighboring village. The population here is part of a different ethnic group. They're Muslims as well, and all of the girls have to go through genital mutilation. Gundo wants to convince these villagers to finally consider ending the tradition. This quickly looks like a failed attempt. The atmosphere here is different, much more aggressive than in Gundo's home village. Without the consent of the men, we can't talk to the women. The village chief is not there, even though, or perhaps because, he knew we were coming. It's clearly a rejection. The men hide behind silence. Although she often meets with rejection, Gundo has had success in other villages. It only works if the village elders and religious leaders are on board, like the imam here in her home village of Dugi. Once a month, a group of up to 40 women affected by FGM meet in Berlin. Here in this self-help group in Waldfrieda Hospital, 
women have a space to tell their stories. It's a freedom they did not have in Africa. As time goes on, the group has only grown. We are the first camera team allowed to film here. After the self-help group, I meet Mariam. A few months ago, she decided to have reconstructive surgery. Cut at the age of seven, her story is as cruel as those of the other women. Now she's on the mend. Sie haben sich ja jetzt entschieden, ähm, sich rekonstruieren zu lassen. Genau. Wie kam es dazu? Ich war bei meinem Frauenarzt und der hat mir das eben empfohlen. Ne? Mein Klitoris ist nach oben gewandert, also das, die werden das einfach mal so rekonstruieren, sozusagen. Ich warte erst mal, muss ich mir das überlegen. Hatte ich natürlich Angst auch, weil ich hatte auch Albträume, dass ich davon gestorben bin und so weiter. Bis zum 11. Mai 2015, dann kam ich hier auch zur Selbsthilfegruppe. Und dann habe ich mich einfach mal entschieden, dann halt mich rekonstruieren lassen. Und wie geht es Ihnen jetzt? Ähm, viel, viel besser, außer ein paar Schmerzen noch ein bisschen. Aber ja, ich fühle mich sehr wohl. Weil für mich ist es ja so, dass mir wurde was weggenommen und es ist ja wieder da. Ich bin total beeindruckt von Ihrem Mut und auch von den offenen Worten. Ich weiß es nicht, aber für mich also, es ist es wichtig, was zu sagen, weil ich habe viel früher also Mund zu, einfach gar nicht sagen. Und das hat mir nicht viel geholfen. Es hat mich einfach mal äh, zurückgezogen, sozusagen. Einfach, ich war so für mich einfach weggeschickt oder ich war einfach alleine, verschlossen. Und für mich denke ich, man soll darüber offen reden. Und diese Chance haben wir einfach nicht in Afrika. I would have liked to know more about Mariam, her history and her wishes for the future. But Mariam asked for some rest after this first interview. She needs time to deal with the feelings that arise from going through reconstructive surgery and adapting to a new life. There are only a handful of women in the United Kingdom who openly address and combat FGM. Women like Alimatu have publicized the issue and put it on the political agenda. Now Alimatu is helping other women break the taboo as well, because most sufferers remain silent. They're afraid of how their communities will react. Activists who speak out, I know of many who have to move away from their homes because they are seen as threats. What, what does that backlash look like specifically? I would give you from the sneers, like people walking in the street and going like this in your face or getting eggs thrown at your face, this is literal. What? Or you have comments on social media or you get letters in the post. So for any woman, they have to also be working and be faced with this reality that they are in that um, I'm going to go back and face my family. I'm going to go back and face those people that I said have done this to me. And they want to be loved. They want to be cared for. They want to belong somewhere. Because what you don't want is to have women feeling even more so ostracized. Often, Alimatu is the first stop for women who need assistance. The young woman who wishes to remain anonymous has contacted her. And with Alamatu's help, she managed to finally talk about the violence done to her. What's your dream for the future? Yeah, my dream is like to work like charities, helping girls that goes like girls that they're forced to get married or early marriages or this FGM. I just want people to stop it. So I'm gonna like be an activist on that. Why is that important to you? Yeah, because I know what I go through. So I don't want people to be victim like me or I don't know, victim survivors like me. I wanna help survivors like me so that they can come out 
and speak to themselves. It's a special challenge to break the silence here. Gundo finds it difficult to talk to me about the details, although she actively campaigns against FGM. She only wanted to talk about the complications she had with her pregnancy. After her difficulties with childbirth, she assisted the maternity ward of the village with women who were struggling through the same issues. J'étais très fatiguée. On m'avait épuisé et venir encore, réparer encore. J'étais très fatiguée avec souffrance. J'ai fait deux jours avec l'accouchement. Deux jours. 28 heures de temps, je suis en travail. Ensuite, j'étais très fatiguée. Je pense que c'est avec l'excision qui a fait ça. Même si je ne peux pas répondre, c'est pas grave. Here in Senegal, many girls are sewn up after removal of the clitoris and labia. In the end, Gundo revealed even more and told me that the pain from cutting before birth is far from the only problem. Tu perds beaucoup de sang. Tu n'auras pas tu n'auras pas beaucoup d'amour avec ton mari aussi. Ça va te perdre tout ça. Ce n'est pas la même chose avec la femme qui n'est pas excisée. Tu peux, tu, peux, tu, peux, tu peux te mettre au lit avec ton mari sans avoir de, sans envie de, de le faire quand même. Parce que ça fait mal ou pourquoi parce, parce que ça fait mal. Parce que tu n'as pas de choix en ce moment. Tu ne peux pas refuser. Tu n'as pas le droit de refuser aussi. These twins came into the world seven months ago. They're the children of the midwife of the maternity ward. Gundo has three sons, but she wants a daughter now that everything is changing. Je souhaite aux tous les filles du Sénégal qui ne sont pas excisées, qui ne doivent pas, qui ne doivent pas, qui ne soient pas excisées, tous les filles du Sénégal. It's a big dream, but it has begun to be realized as Gundo works to help more villagers renounce this sad and tired tradition. In her home village, the daughter of the midwife is the first generation to grow up unharmed. <laughs>